Join From Beer to the Bible every week as Irvin Lee and co-host Sarah Oliveira McDonald warn others of the consequences of drug and alcohol addiction by being the voice of faith-based recovery. Every week, Irvin and Sarah help people get access to the treatment and counseling they so desperately need. They explore the depths of addiction and give practical life examples of how to recover and develop a new rhythm of living. The show is gritty, authentic, and simply raw while being rooted in the love, faith, and hope of God. Welcome to From Beer to the Bible. Good afternoon and welcome to From Beer to the Bible. I'm your host, Irvin Lee. Hi, Sarah. We miss you. Wish you were here, but we're going to hold it down and I'm super excited. Our theme today is being mad at God. Being mad at God. God. And I have my new good friend and brother in Christ, Obi, here with me. Say hello, Obi. Hello, Irvin. I am so happy to be able to share in this moment talking yeah. about this topic. Yeah. Being mad at God is something that I am very familiar with. I've been there and from time to time I get back there. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. no doubt. I think one of the things I have to tell you guys quickly how I discovered Obi. He was actually speaking at Men of Nehemiah. Shout out to Men of Nehemiah and all the great work that they do. And I said to myself, man, how do I not know this brother? He gave such a powerful, God-fearing and blessed message that I had to have you on the show, man. And welcome. And I want to jump right into your story and your testimony. I... I want to talk about how the genesis of this topic came to be for me being mad at God. Yeah. One, I am a person in long-term recovery. Mm -hmm. My sobriety date is August the 5th of 1992. So wow. that's 30 years. Yeah. In a couple of months to be 31. But we just, like they said, don't count the chickens before they hatch. Hey, amen. We do this thing one day at a time. Yep. But how, how my process uh, began for me, mm -hmm. my, my dad died when I was eight and I'm an only child okay. and my mother died when I was 15. Wow. And so I suffered those losses early on in my life mm -hmm. and people were saying God is sovereign and God is good. And I'm as a child, I'm thinking, how could a loving God do something so tragic okay. to a young child to leave him alone with, with nobody to help. Mm -hmm. And so I was confused and mad at God okay. for that. Was your family Christian at the time? Did you know the Lord? No. Okay. No. Okay. At what point, so you, so you weren't raised Christian and you, you didn't know the Lord, but you knew there was a God and you were mad at him. At what point do you come to Christ in your story? I come to Christ when I, as a result of that, mm -hmm. I started to use. I was okay. at an early age, I was okay. smoking marijuana and, and drinking okay. probably around 85, 86. I okay. started to uh, smoke crack. Oh, wow. And okay. that didn't last long. It was probably about a year okay. where I found myself from being stable and productive to homeless. And so this outreach team from the program that I went to, uh, Golden Gate, yeah. came and found me wow, out there. Man. And that's when I was introduced to recovery okay. and to the Lord. Okay. Now, as we talk about your losing your parents, so you lose both parents. Yes. Now, where do you, who takes you in and how does that work after you I'm, lose? I went and moved with, with a cousin. Okay. And... I was so angry and mm -hmm. so hurt. Mm. I, looking back on it, I never gave them a fair chance. Okay. Because I, I felt that if I loved somebody, I was going to lose them. Oh. So my heart was hard. Okay. And so, and so I shut people off and pushed people away. Okay. And so that's how the addiction was able to to come in because that was the only place that I found comfort and solace mm -hmm. was in my addiction. You know, they say that using drugs is self-medication. Yeah. So I was numbing the pain that I was in because I didn't have a way to to deal with the issues and the pain that I had. Okay. 
when did you first start using or your first time how was you introduced to it and then after you were introduced to it this being this notion of being mad at this guy that you knew was up there but you didn't really understand how did all of that play into your addiction well i i believe this that we all have a void in in our heart that mm -hmm. only god can feel mm -hmm. right and before that we fill it with whatever yeah but i was introduced to marijuana probably the summer between the sixth grade and the seventh grade wow, that's and young. i probably not probably i got high every day okay up until the time i came to treatment wow. and i have a son who's 25 okay right and when i seen him when you know at 12 you know little bitty kid i'm like yeah. who was selling drugs to to the you know what i'm saying yeah small kid i'm you know yeah five feet three or four of a buck 20 or something but but getting high every day yeah uh and so that's how it happened and then okay. it just escalated okay uh, now did the, the family your cousins that you were living with did when did they become aware that you might be using drugs well they they knew Okay. They knew my my cousins that I was living with. Uh, uh -huh. They was using. Okay, but you know, like today, you know, yeah. we was we was drinking and smoking weed, so we felt yeah. that that was harmless. Yeah. Now my my cousin, my my aunt didn't, you know, yeah. but you know, we like you know, I'm yeah. just smoking a little weed, drinking a little wine. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm cool. Yeah, so that's what it was. But okay. I did not take notice mm -hmm. that I was doing this every day. Wow. And yeah. so when did you realize, so you, you're smoking, you're drinking, you're doing this stuff every day. When did you kind of reach the point where you're like, wait a minute, I'm not digesting this like everybody else. And this is becoming a problem for me. When, when I started to smoke crack. Okay. You know, crack is not a recreational drug. No. It's a dominant drug. Okay. And so uh, two things. Mm -hmm. One. I am so grateful that crack took me down quick. Okay. And so, like I said, I only used probably from 87, the mm -hmm. middle of 87, okay. 89, I was in treatment. Okay. So it was about a year, year and a half. Oh, that was and quick. And so, so I don't have the story that a lot of people that I came to treatment with mm -hmm. that's 30 years and still going in and out all mm -hmm. of those years. Yeah. That's not my story. Okay. Although I had, I had several relapses. Okay. I stayed clean 18 months one time okay. and, and then I relapsed okay. and then got back on track yeah. and been clean ever since. So I, I don't have that long period of, of, relapsing and using crack and stuff like that. It was a short, so that was a good thing that, yeah. that it took me out yeah. and brought me to my knees and, and I, I sought help. Yeah, talk a little bit about the, and I'm gonna frame it up this way. Okay. Sometimes the importance of a relapse that then leads you to permanent recovery because a lot of times we don't talk, uh, it feels like we don't talk about relapse in the right context. So I want you to talk Absolutely. about that. In the, in the text in relapse and recovery, it talks about that. Mm -hmm. It talks about that relapse can bring about a more rigorous application of the program, mm. right? And so that's what it done for me. Okay. That the rel my relapse was a blessing for me. When I had Good. that 18 months, it was a shaky 18 months. Uh -huh. I wasn't committed, but I was staying clean. Mm -hmm. And so once I relapsed, I believe this, and I'll get back to it, that okay. relapse, in order to stay sober, you gotta be willing to do anything that it takes to stay clean. Yeah. And so that's what it was for me, Irvin. When I when I when I when I relapsed and went to the treatment center, yeah. my support group told me, hey, Obi, this is what we want you to do. Yeah. They said, you're arrogant. I was like, there's no way that I could be arrogant. That was the first <laughs> sign that I was arrogant, I right? Yeah, but great. they said, you know, yeah. we're going to take your car. We want you to, to catch the bus. The girlfriend that you are with, we, we want you to, you're using her, we want you to, to, yeah. to not date her, and we want you to go into this sober living facility. 
Now, these brothers have no authority wow. over my life, right? Yeah, yeah. But those things I done. Mm -hmm. I put my car in wow. my friend's garage, and I caught the bus. Wow. The lady I was dealing with, I let her go. I stayed in this treatment center yeah. for six months. I haven't used since. Oh, man, that's impressive. And we talk a lot. In the Bible, it talks a lot about pride and humility mm -hmm. and humbling ourselves. And talk about that moment because you just put humility into application. Absolutely. Like I said, I, I had been clean for 18 months. Mm -hmm. Although it was shaky, yep. I had I had got a glimpse mm -hmm. as I was sharing when, at the men of Nehemiah. I had seen the promised land. Yes. I knew what freedom <laughs> and recovery looked like. Okay. Then I fell off August the 1st of 92. Okay. I came back August the 5th. So in those four days, I, I got a chance to see all of those things that I had left. Mm -hmm. And I did not want to go back and experience that. That's what helped me okay. to be willing to do all of those things. It's what a humility humility came in. Okay. I was like, whoa, if I don't do something drastic, I'm gonna go back to where I where I was. Yeah. yeah. It's it's amazing. I was working for this company and I was a corporate trainer, right? Yeah. And no, I was a supervisor and they was interviewing me for the for the trainer position, right? Mm -hmm. And I relapsed. Man. Two days, no call, no show. We know that the third day, if you don't, so I called. And I came back in. The day I came back in, August the 5th, yep. I got the promotion. Wow. One day clean. I'm over to the department and I'm one day clean. Wow. That's, that's uh, God's provision. And Absolutely. giving you the opportunity. Now, how did you feel, and where was, where was fear in that? Because you're one day clean, and now you're over the department. Mm -hmm. So where was your fear in that, and where were you with the Lord at that point? I had had a relationship with the Lord. Yeah. Obviously, I wasn't walking and trusting him. Yeah. But I was afraid, but at the same time, that was him assuring me that I got you. Yeah. Just you. trust me. Yeah. And so... That's what I done. I, I just I just walked through it. Yeah. And it put me in a place of trust and humility because one, I didn't know what I was doing. Mm -hmm. I was scared. Now here I am, Mr. Bussy <laughs> from nine to five. Yeah. And you know how I don't know if you went to treatment, but sometimes yeah, treatment yeah. is they don't treat y'all with a whole bunch of respect <laughs> and love. And, you, you know, so I'm this other guy. Yeah. Sit down somewhere and shut up. Yeah. yeah. In the evening. Yeah. And that was the contradiction. Yeah. yeah. You, you, you know, yeah. and I had to learn how to navigate those two spaces. Okay. So, man, that that's so rich and so much is going on. When do you ad uh, address being mad at God about your parents in and what you believed at the time was, I'm being left alone. We both know you were never alone because the father was with you. Absolutely. One, one uh, the program director had to help me to really understand the sovereignty of God. Mm. Yeah. And, and that was, and that he had a plan and a purpose. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we don't understand it. And so... I had to learn to get all right with that. The other part was once I learned the sovereignty of God yeah. and the power of God, I knew he had the power to deliver me. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And why won't he deliver me the way I want to be delivered? <laughs> why do I need to go to treatment? Yeah. I'm one of those people that I think about using every day. Mm-hmm. And I believe that's that thing in with when Second Corinthians were that's that thorn. Yeah. That's a reminder that, hey, I got you. Yeah. That I don't want you to get out there and get too far. Yeah. So I allow these cravings and these thoughts. I don't have gut wrenching thoughts. Yeah. I have fleeting thoughts to let me know that, hey, you are still yeah. that addict. Yeah. But my grace is sufficient. Mm, and so I was mad because I didn't like the way he was delivering me. I, I had an idea, Lord, just take it away from me yeah. and let me go. And a friend of mine asked me this. He said, Obi, can God trust you with the deliverance that you're asking for? 
And he said, now let me qualify that. Yep. Would you serve him if he set you free? Yeah. And, you know, obviously I lied and said, sure, sure I would. I would. <laughs> you know, he like, no, well, obviously <laughs> that's not the truth because yeah. he won't give it to you. Yeah. And so this is the thing that keeps you serving. That's why when you met me over at Men of Nehemiah, yeah. I was over there bringing fire yeah. like I could. You, you see what I'm saying? <laughs> because True. that's the thing. God yeah. says that, you know, yeah. I will keep you away from this addiction and bless you if you allow me to use you. Mm. And so I had to learn how to be all right with that. Yeah. And that took a, that took a while. Yeah. E even in my own story, I felt similar i'm like lord i've heard these stories and i prayed for a long time why don't you just touch me and heal me years later i realized that going to treatment and the process for my recovery i actually needed that because if god would have just touched me and healed me mm -hmm. i wasn't gonna serve him Absolutely. and i was gonna go back out and do my thing because i would just come back to god then and say touch me again mm -hmm. and this time I'll do it right so that wouldn't work for me right when right. I hear people say God just touched them and took away their addiction I, I used to look at them with envy but I had to look at my own walk and say for as stiff neck like the Bible talks about the Israelites being stiff neck yeah. as stiff neck as I was the touch would not have kept me in obedience and walking by the power of the Holy Spirit absolutely let me add this you, you know we we get a lot of stories in in yeah. Christendom that's not true, yeah. right? Yeah. And I was taught that there was different classes of deliverance. Uh huh. Okay. You know that if he he just touched you and he set you free, then that's first class deliverance. Yeah. If you got to go through treatment, that's that's a lower class, and that's not true. <laughs> yeah. If you are set free, you set you are free indeed. Yeah. If, you know if, if, it's if, not you, you know, but. That's what was confused. I'm like, well, you're giving me a lesser form, right. but I'm clean and, and I'm and I'm operating and he's blessing me. No, brother, you you good? Yeah, that it, man. I'm so glad you addressed that. And as we get ready to close, I want you one speak about what's on your heart because you always, like you say, you bring the fire. Give our viewers practical steps they can take about dealing with being mad at God. Because whether we admit it or not, we all have those moments and have had those moments. Absolutely. Um, one of the things I had to realize that there was a God, I got this from Rick Warren, yeah. and I wasn't him. Mm, that, that was it. And so it was, and I had to look at that I was trying to get my way. Mm -hmm. And what that is saying to wow. me is that I know better about my life and this world than God. And so when I get in those times when I get mad at him, which is often, mm -hmm. I have to learn to trust and accept the fact that he knows better for this world and for me yeah. than I do. Yeah. And, and that's hard for me sometimes. That's the arrogance <laughs> because I think I know better. Hey, speak you, you on know, it. Me too. Uh, speak on uh, it. I'm one of my you. spiritual advisors, he said, Obi, you a God with the little G. <laughs> you, yeah, you know, yeah. Because we all walk around being the God of our own life. Yeah. That's when we're trying to take control. Mm -hmm. And so it helps me to, to not be mad at God when mm -hmm. I accept the fact that, that he knows better for me. Mm -hmm. and, and, and off air, you and I were talking about these moments we have, right, in our own heads where I'm really upset and disappointed in God, but I'm not going to talk to God. I'm not going to tell mm -hmm. God. So address that a little bit for our viewers. Well, I had to understand that God knew <laughs> my thoughts. He knew me from afar. Yeah. He knew my he knew me in my mother's womb, so he knows me. Whether I articulate my anger, he already knows what's in my heart. Mm -hmm. And so, and I also had to understand that my God is big enough mm -hmm. to be able to handle mm -hmm. me verbalizing my anger, yeah. and it wasn't going to offend him. That's why I love the Psalms. David spoke. Yes. And, and let God know that, hey, I'm, I don't like this. Or, yeah. or why are you not smiting yeah. them down and do that? You see what I'm <laughs> yeah, saying? Yeah, he did. And so, 
I found out it was all right for me to have an honest relationship with God and to be able to talk to him and say, God, I don't like how you're doing this. Or at best, I don't understand what you are doing. Mm. Make it clear to me. Mm-hmm. Help me to understand. Now, sometimes he, he does, yeah. and sometimes he doesn't. Be right. But it don't hurt for me to ask and yeah. be able to say, Lord, you know, I don't like this. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to do it, but I don't like the way you, you, you're you doing this. That's an honest relationship. Yeah. That's the kind of relationship we want with our spouses, our children, our friends. A honest relationship. Um, I end with this, you, you know. Nobody wants a one-way relationship right. where we do all of the talking and don't, don't do any listening. Mm-hmm. When we give all the advice and, and we don't receive any. Mm-hmm. And I learned that I had to have an open relationship with God where I allowed him to speak to me mm-hmm. and I spoke back. That's a dialogue. That's what God wants. That's what a relationship is. Yeah. I, I think we often, and I'm, a, I'm, I'm in the we, lose sight of the fact that he is our father he is our lord but we're supposed to be in relationship with him right. and relationship goes both ways Absolutely. and when i talk to him when i need to lament like david i said lord i'm on the friend side of god right now so i'm talking to you because you're a friend too you're my father but Absolutely. You're my, i'm talking to you i'm disappointed i'm upset i verbalized that in my conversations with him Where in the past, to your point, I pushed that down as if he didn't know. Mm -hmm. So I want our viewers to, as as we close out, I want you to know that your Heavenly Father desires and wants and has made available through Christ Jesus a loving, meaningful relationship. And I spent many years thinking God was mad and disappointed at me. Right, that I was off track, that I, I was not pleasing to God because I thought God was up there keeping score. Mm-hmm. Right. And then I, I I realized that there's grace and there's new mercies every morning. And I, I certainly need those. So I want you to close us out with tell the world what you do now, where they can reach you if they need to reach you, and close us out with a word. All right. I'll start with the word. Yeah. One of my favorite scriptures, man, right after, right before Jesus went and was tempted, okay. after he was baptized, mm-hmm. the Spirit of the Lord landed and said, you are my son in whom I'm well pleased. Mm. He hadn't healed anybody. He hadn't raised anybody from the dead. He said, you are my son and in whom I'm well pleased. And God, that's God. I, that gives me comfort that I am the son of God. And he is pleased with me, not based on my works, not based on my sins or my failures, but just because I'm his creation and he loves me. Mm -hmm. But what I am doing now, I was executive director of the same treatment center that I I went through the first time for 27 years. Yes. And so uh, a month ago, I retired. Oh, congratulations. And so now I am doing consulting. And, okay. and I'm consulting with several agencies. And mm-hmm. the name of my company is the Equipping Network. And my email address, I think, is, is ob, obie mm-hmm. dot equipping network at gmail.com. Okay. We love that. OBU, we're going to have you back again. You bless me that day and you blessed me again today thank you and i know that you lost your parents early on but man i know i know they proud because when i saw you i was like i saw the light and the presence of the living god shining in and through you so much so you see it provoked me god is a god of action and i saw god working in and through you I'm like, I have to act. I have to get him on our show so he could share his testimony and all that God did for him in perceived loss and took all of that and turned it into an amazing God-given Holy Spirit testimony where you give us the fire. So I appreciate you, brother. And we look forward to having you again. To all our viewers, please like, share, and subscribe to From Beer to the Bible. And if you need and desire, and we would 
certainly hope you would support us at FromBeerToTheBible.com because we survive on your donations. God richly bless you all. Thank you for tuning in to this week's From Beer to the Bible. Make sure to tune in next week when Irvin and Sarah gift you with even more addiction recovery information. Make sure to like, share, and subscribe. You can find us on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And remember, we're always there for you.